<laughs> okay, so uh, last week we looked at the first of the white lies, which is where they take Romans 28 about, you know, all things working for the good and all that, just kind of screw it up and twist it around. And the two verses after that verse, Romans 28, Romans 8, 29 through 30, um, brought up the idea of predestination. And so we're going to look at the idea, um, are we predestined or do we have free will as far as uh, salvation? Now, there is a philosophical debate about whether or not people really have a choice. Um, we're not going to look at that debate. We're looking at simply the idea of salvation, whether we are predestined to be saved or whether we choose to be saved. So, um, the passage that we brought up last week, For those uh, God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And so typically, there's these two kind of ideas going on here. Now, it's, it's hard to say this because sometimes people have a view that's not really it's kind of like a self-contradicting view and so i can't say there's just these two views because sometimes people do have a self-contradicting view the most broadly they're calvinism and arminianism now calvinism is usually uh, uh believed by baptist churches and so sometimes people even use those terms interchangeably incorrectly but they use them in, in, uh, interchangeably oh baptist theology or calvinist theology um, it was started, whatever, by uh, a guy, John Calvin, from the Reformation period. Long story, but going back to the main idea here, um, God's grace is irresistible. So basically, um, if he chooses you to be saved, you cannot resist his grace. Like, you will be saved. You know, it's like, imagine the Sith Lord controlling your brains. Um, you know, obviously, except God wouldn't be a Sith, duh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in Calvinism, by default, God doesn't call everyone because if he did call you, you would have to be saved because his grace is irresistible, so that would mean that he doesn't call everyone. Um, you can't lose your salvation, um, though there are many people who are fake. They seem to be saved, but they're not really saved. Um, this, this has spawned kind of a false theology. The false theology is this, once saved, always saved. That's not actually what Calvinists, Calvinists believe. Um, it's more of just a twisting of what they believe. See, they believe that you can't lose your salvation because the true will stay faithful to God. S but what people have done is, okay, so that means once saved, always saved, so I can live however I want. Which obviously the Calvinists would say, no, if you live however you want, that just proves that you were never saved in the first place. See what I mean? So. People who don't really understand theology will say, oh, once saved, always saved, but not even Cal not even Calvinists believe this. The people who believe that are just like kind of like people who – like a folksy theology. It's not really something that serious theologians believe. Um, the idea of Calvinism is is an honorable one. It's, it's based on God's sovereignty. That's the main focus, that God's sovereignty is supreme, that he has his will, he has his way. Everything is ordained. He never loses, loses control over a situation, that kind of idea. The flip of that would be Arminianism, which most Pentecostal churches would believe in more of an Arminianism than um, than a Calvinism. The idea is that God gives you the choice. Um, God is still supreme in this view, but doesn't directly cause everything. And this is where the big uh, problem arises. Some people would say, well, if God doesn't directly cause something, that would mean he's not in control, which means he's not sovereign, which means that you're now hereby saying that God is not in control of his creation, which... That is worth considering. Think about this. So something happens that's not what that was not God's will. So is God not in control, or is He not able to stop it, which means He's not all powerful, or is He just not good where He just doesn't care? See what I mean? That that brings up a lot of questions there, which have to be addressed. Obviously, and Calvinism gets around all those by just saying about preessence. So. Uh, so, okay, so basically, um, in Arminianism, God is still supreme, but he doesn't directly cause everything. So, like, for instance, Adam and Eve's failure. No matter how you twist it, in Calvinism, you're left with this, that basically God ordered evil people to be evil. I mean, you, you can twist it all you want. That's what Calvinism comes down to. Adam and Eve were destined to sin. 
They didn't have a choice in the matter. Which begs the question, how can God really be angry and punish people who he made do something bad? If they really didn't have a choice in it, you're kind of – now, once again, God being sovereign, which is their main their main effort to focus that God is sovereign, it really doesn't matter um, to justify it or not because, hey, he's sovereign, just tough, deal with it, which is fine uh, for a lot of people. But I kind of see that – to me, it seems like you, you can't really have a good God if he's like, you will sin so that I can make you receive my grace. Like that just doesn't really seem like – God, this just seemed kind of strong-armed. Um, um, you can cease to have salvation in Arminianism, which means you can get saved and unsaved, however you want to say that. Um, but there would ob obviously still be fakes, people who pretend to be Christian, but that's, I mean, even Jesus talked about this, the tares and the wheat. No matter how you look at it, there, there are going to be some people who are, fakes. are fake, aren't really saved. They just kind of go through the motions. Um how can God be sovereign if people can act contrary to his will? That's that's the big question that Arminianism has to answer is, you know, if, if, if God is sovereign, how come his will is not always um, followed? So from this come to, uh, come a, comes a heresy which has been attached to Arminianism. Basically, a lot of people think Calvinism is the only choice because Arminianism is heresy, which is not true. This 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 I, this heresy that we're about to look at is called Pelagianism, and actually it doesn't really have anything to do with Arminianism. It's just oftentimes combined with it. Okay, so this is a really basic definition. Pelagianism, in its most basic form, is the idea that we can be saved on our on our own. We can w God is is not really a factor in it. We just simply choose. So um, God's it, it's not necessary that God calls or that God gives His grace. I simply choose whether or not to be saved or not. It's completely on my part, which the entire Bible teaches against that. And this was obviously condemned as a heresy. That's totally is a heresy. Um, but then people say, well, doesn't Arminianism teach that? Well, no, and I'll look at that in just a second. But um, semi-Pelagianism is a view that tried to reconcile the two extremes. So not Pelagianism, but not the traditional Calvinism, whatever. Um, we can be saved on our own, but God is responsible after we're saved for us growing. So it's like, okay, that doesn't really address the issue. Um, so is Arminianism by default Pelagianism? No, it is not. Before we get going on that, let's let's I'll, I'll come back to this idea and we'll answer this in just a little bit. But first off, I want to look at this question: Are we um, are we predestined? Can we can we lose our salvation? So let's look at uh, Hebrews six four through six is a good starting plate starting place. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. To be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are cru crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So the idea here is that somebody can, in fact, reach a place of no longer being saved. Now, the specifics about whether or not you can lose your salvation and regain it or not, that's not in today's discussion. I just want to talk about the idea of can you get saved and then reach a place of not being saved? Well, I think Hebrews 6 makes it absolutely clear, yes, you can. Matthew 13, 1 through 6 is another good example of this. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. The seed falling on rocky ground refers... I'm sorry, I think I missed a, missed a verse, but I guess not. Okay, so then that takes us... Hop down to verses 20 through 22. The seed falling on, falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. So this is somebody who does get saved. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Okay, so there was clearly salvation there. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word. So then Calvinism would say this. Okay, so they started in doing good things or whatever, but they didn't stick with it. And only the, the saved are those who, will, who only will stick with it. Well, then that kind of oversimplifies the issue. Can somebody get saved, lose their salvation, get saved again? Well, in Calvinism, you would say irrelevant conversation. 
only the righteous will be saved. So it's like, well, you're kind of not really answering the question. And what they would say, well, you're getting caught up on details that you don't understand. Which I would admit that there's a lot of things that we don't understand, but th I feel like that's just kind of sidesteps the issue. But, so, but the words of the life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So let's look at the idea of once saved, always saved. Can someone start as a Christian and then fall away? Yes. However, it should be noticed, n noticed that you can't just accidentally lose your salvation. This isn't some of the whoops. It's a gradual process. So you can't really lose your salvation. You more of give it away. You you slowly start doing and start um, living a sinful life, and 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 as time passes, your heart changes, and uh, you reach a place where you just kind of go your own way. So it's it's not the main point here to get from this is it's not so much where you used to be. Oh, well, I, I used to do this for for the church, or I used to you know be a good person. Where are you now? And uh, by analyzing our heart, I think is a good place to start. Um, so I do want to point out that most of the discussion on predestination is based on theories and not really as it applies to you. It's it's this simple. Regardless of whether you go Calvinism or, or Arminianism, what it comes down to is, are you seeking God today? That's really the, the bottom line. So the offer is open for all to be saved. There is no way for us to know, however, who will be saved. That's an important point to make. Well, how do I know that this person will be saved? What if I put forth all my time and effort into this person and then they fall away? There's no way that we can know that. Um, and also, there's no way to know who will fall away. Like, okay, let's say, for instance, um, you know, Gracie is saved now, but she will fall away in the future. How will I know that? Well, I don't know. I don't know what will happen in the future. Um, there's also no way for us to know who is saved now. So, I mean, we like to have comfort areas and these little boxes where you put things in it. The real world doesn't really work like that. So, once, all, once saved, always saved, saved, no. Not even Calvinists would teach that. So, now we get to the idea of, are we predestined? Well, in a way of looking at it, yes. And I think Romans 8, 29-30 talked about that, that those who God foreknew, he predestined. So, there is some form of predestination happening. That takes us to two different perspectives. <laughs> this I know this is getting a little bit complicated, so if something doesn't make sense, just ask and I'll try and clarify it. From our perspective, we have free will. But from God's perspective, he already knows what you will choose. So how do those two things kind of connect? Not quite sure, but what it comes down to is you worry about you and let God worry about being God. <laughs> Those he knows will be saved. He has predestined or pre-planned for the struggle to work the character of Christ into them. So let's say, for instance, okay, the, the, the dawn of creation, God, Jesus, they're, they're creating, God is creating, and he says, okay, I'm going to make Isaiah in, you know, 2000 whenever you were born. Uh, 1997. What? 1997. 1997. And, uh, you know, and then he's he's going to accept me. And so I'm going to bring by a couple things, or things are going to come by, either or. It doesn't really matter for this discussion. And I'm going to cause it to work character into him that will make him more like me. See what I mean? Those who God foreknew, he also predestined. Um so God pre-planned or predestined for those struggles to work the character of Christ in, into us. So going through the list from Romans 8, he calls us. That would be the initial draw of God to accept him. He justifies us. This would be where we accept God, and he marks us as, as justified in the presence of God. Uh, and then he glorifies us. This would be the process in the future where we are given the resurrected body, and you know we enter into glory and all that. So our free will... But God initiates and sees it through. So what we have here is we have Arminianism that doesn't have to be Pelagianism. It's our free will, but God was the one who does the initiate, initiating, and God was also the one who's seeing it through. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8-10. through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So I want to point out, I'm going to point this verse out bit by bit. Pay attention to this, because this is, this is important. If we have free will, do does that mean that we get the glory of accepting, see what I mean? Like, oh, I have accepted God. 
the glory is mine. Well, no. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 just showed us this. First off, God seeks us first. Then he saves us by his grace, not by our works. So there's nothing we say or do or anything we will become in the future that makes us worthy of, 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 of that grace, that makes us worthy of being saved. Not even our great faith, because check this out. The next thing he says in Ephesians is that he is the one who gave us the ability to have faith. So not even our faith is from ourselves. He does the work of changing us. We are not – I mean obviously you put forth effort and that kind of stuff. What I'm talking about is that, that heart change. Only God can accomplish that. You can change yourself. You can work on, on your traits. You can – you know that – absolutely. I'm not trying to say anything about that, but I'm talking about that heart change. Only God can accomplish that. Um, God is the one who justifies us. So without Jesus, we're not justified in the presence of God. And then who's the one who's glorifying us? Well, God again. God planned for us to do the good works as well. So we can't even brag about the good works that we've done because God was the one who planned for those good works for us to do. <laughs> so, And then it is only by Christ that we stand justified. So ultimately what we have here is, yes, you can believe in Arminianism that I have a choice. But you can also believe that God is supreme and he's the one, and without him there is, there, there is no salvation. So that, that brings up a very important thing that kind of bothers a lot of people. So am I passive in salvation? I, I'm not responsible for any aspect of it. God just kind of does his thing and I stand up to the side like, well, not, not really. Although God obviously is, is the one who's enabling this to happen and that kind of stuff. You all right? Um, there, there does need to be some things that are pointed out. We are the ones who, are, who accept. God does give us the free will to accept. We also have to choose to trust, and then our faith doesn't really mean much if we don't if there's no works. So in other words, we have to choose to obey God as well. Um, so when we take when we choose with our free will this option, we we are partners working with God. We are adopted in as heirs. Well, then the other option that we have of our own free will that we can choose is we can reject God. We can doubt and disobey Him. And then that would make us rebels fighting God, and we would be orphans. See, so the option is totally – the, the choice is totally ours. The choice is ours, but we are not self-made. Whatever you choose, you have to accept the fact that you are not a self-made person. No one is an island. You can't say, I have all that I have because of my own might and power. You can't choose where you were born, when you were born, what you had when you were born. You can't even choose um, all – how successful you will be in life. Sometimes life almost seems like a roll of the dice. Sometimes it seems completely unfair, and sometimes it seems like, wow, I'm overcome with all these blessings. What did I do to deserve them? Well, nothing. God just has a way of raising some people up and pushing some others down. I don't exactly know how that works, but I don't really need to know how that works. What it comes down to here is we can't boast of how great we have become because all of our greatness is because God has allowed us to become that or caused us depending on which situation so god does not force us although he knows what we will choose that's that's a very important distinction that right there god does not force us to choose but he does know what we will choose he also knows what will have um made the biggest impact uh, in our life like for instance let's say let's say he says this if this happens then nicole will accept me see what i mean he understands um our breaking point. Right, right. And now that takes us to another point. Just because God foreknew doesn't mean that he doesn't experience in the moment. What that means is that God is acting now. Just because God foreknew what he was going to do back then does not mean that God is – so God does exist out of time, but he acts in time. Does that kind of make sense? So God is still present in this moment. He's not like just something that stuck out in, out in like this non-existent place and he's just like – Oh, like, you know, druggies imagine things being, you know, out in some, like, it's not, it's not like that. Um, so, so that, that brings up the question, so how does God treat people who he knows won't be saved? Well, there's a lot of verses who talk about this, and I think Matthew 5.45 is, is a great starting point. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So regardless of, of what somebody will choose, God still raises some up that don't deserve it. He still blesses people who are evil. He still gives people chances. He still loves them knowing what they will choose. 
God does not have conditional love, like, okay, because you're going to be good enough, I will love you. Are you going to say something? Well, and it, somewhere in there it says that uh, he wants everyone to come to your knowledge. Saying Peter. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so. God is not... Um, God is not... Uh, really the, any the idea is that he's not just being, like, flippant. He's being patient on purpose in, you know, in the in the plan or the hopes, whatever you want to say there, that people will be saved. Um, so... I believe that's Second Peter three ten, if I remember correctly, um, and so that brings us to Hebrews three seven through eight, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless unless what I said before is true. So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. So there is an option there of hardening your heart, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. Now I could say more there, but. I'm not, because this lesson has already been about 20 minutes, and I don't want to go any further than that. So I'll just summarize what we looked at from last week with Romans 8.28, and to this week with uh, answering the idea of predestination. So God foreknew you, so he predestined you. Then he called you, and you turned to God in faith and freely chose Christ. That's, that's how that worked. And then, once you turned, and turned to God in faith and freely chose Christ, then he justified you. Which means you are in good standing with God. But you can still leave the faith. God won't ever lose you. You can't lose your salvation, but you can reject him. When you live in sin, it's only a matter of time before you do reject him, since you are rejecting him by your actions. That's just one of those things that causes your heart to change and you reach a place. So the question then becomes, when do you cross the line of no longer being saved? I don't know. I think that only God knows. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important point to make because you're going to see some people messing up and they won't ever come back. And then you're going to see other people messing up and they do come back. And it's it, did, did they cross the line of becoming unsaved and then come back to God? Or did they just never cross the line? I don't know. I don't know. Does God call everyone? Now, this is another thing that's none of my business. <laughs> For, when typically, people get caught up on things that... It bothers them something about God, so they want to know, does God do this for everyone to kind of ease their conscience? All that I can say is this. Focus on the fact that God is calling you now. What are you going to do about it? Rather than policing God and seeing if he's going to do how you want him to do, how about you just stop and say, hey, God, thank you for calling me, and then respond to that. Um, so you can't force someone to believe. This is something that's very important. Even if you have all the right answers, it's still everybody's choice. You can do everything possible for your kids, and then they still reject God. It's not a matter up to you of having the perfect everything for somebody to be saved. And people get kind of really uh, torn up on this because they think, okay, so I'm the I, I'm the light. So that means it's up to me to to you know. And my example of how well, yeah, in a way. You are responsible for how you act, and, and you know you should be showing God in the way that you act, absolutely. But keep in mind that even if you do everything perfect, that doesn't mean that everybody around you is going to get saved. And, do, and just because you try to do the right thing all the time doesn't mean that everybody else will too. See what I mean? There comes a point when you have to let the guilt trip go and realize, yes, I am accountable for how I'm acting and for the example that I'm showing to other people. But also at the same time, I'm giving God my best and... Some people will still, that won't be good enough. You know how I know that? Because Jesus Christ himself was perfect, and that still wasn't good enough for some people. So with that being said, I'm not telling you to go out and sin. That's what I'm saying at all. Yes, you are accountable. God will hold you responsible for every word you say, for, for, the, for the things that you do. Absolutely. But, however, let, let the guilt trip go. So, um, does God call everyone? That's a good freaking question. So how can you apply the things that we that we looked at for the past two weeks? Well, trust God in your mess. That's the first thing you can get from all this. You can't see it all, and you don't know it all, nor do you know how it will play out. So trust God in the mess, and he'll just get you through it. It's Your life is not going to go how you plan. You can still trust God through it. God is always working on our behalf, and he is still in control. Even when it looks like he's out of control, even when it looks like he doesn't know what's happening, God is still in control. Um, third off, you can't fool God. So come to him honestly with, without excuses or lies. Sometimes people like try to try to act like they can fool God or manipulate God. Like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian or whatever. God, God knows the heart. So really, you, you can't fool God. Stop trying to lie to him. Stop trying to give him excuses. Come to him with an honest heart. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, learn to read the Bible for what it says, not what you want it to say. Sometimes when we reach passages like Romans 8.28, we say, oh, well, everything's working to my good. Well, 
Not necessarily. And we looked at this last week, so just remember that. Um, any questions about any of that? No. No? Okay. So uh, I think next week we'll start looking at white line number two. Uh, God is a big old love bug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then sometime after that, I don't know how many weeks we're going to be on that, but sometime after that we'll look at white line number three. The fake is easy to tell from the real because the fake never happens in here. Okay. Because the big thing happens in what? I'll, I'll elaborate more in a couple weeks. Oh, okay.